Hello, everyone. This is Saif Ghazim Ali, uh, moderator for today's event. Thank you so much for joining us today for the fireside chat on Turkish aerospace and defense industry. Um, I would like to introduce our guest first. With me, I have Mr. Shafak Hardem, who is a renowned legal expert, especially in aerospace and defense industry, and founder of Hardem Attorney at Law. He, of course, does not need an introduction, but considering that a few attendees may need to know about the speaker's domain or expertise, I would like to continue, Mr. Uh, I would like to continue with Mr. Hardam's introduction. So Mr. Hardam has advised numerous local and international firms in complex international trade matters. His major expertise are uh, international trade and government con contracts law. And he represented uh, some of the major Fortune 500 companies in various projects of Turkey. He's also an author of the first and only legal book on defense procurement in Turkey, and the list goes on. So th thank you, Mr. Shafak Kardam, for joining us today. Um, you. You're welcome. And our next guest is Mr. Arda Mepdutoğlu, uh, who is an astronautical engineer from Istanbul Technical University and completed his master's degree in science and technology policy studies in international relations from Middle East Technical University. He started his career back in 2004 and served as a senior technology consultant in several firms in defense sector of Turkey. Currently, he is serving as a vice president of defense programs of an international trading and consultancy, which is a nonprofit organization and focusing on, on science and technology education in Turkey. Mr. Mabel Olu is also an author of various books research articles and reports focusing on aerospace and defense technology. Thank you very much, Mr. Mabutolu, for joining us today and sparing some time from your busy schedule. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. So in today's session, we will discuss uh, a few things that I can explain, like a journal outlook, what are current trends, what's happening in this industry, and so on. Uh, Turkish aerospace and defense industry's ability to produce a specific product and technology, privatization efforts in the Turkish aerospace and defense industry, government policies supporting uh, the same industry, right? And challenges and how Turkey got itself in this position today and the ripple effects of recent economic and political developments. So uh, uh, I think we should start from uh, Mr. Arda Mablak Oulu. Uh, regarding some questions that we have. And uh, Mr. Ada, first of all, I want you to explain our general outlook, our, our, our current scenario, what's going on in the industry and what's happening in today's market. Thank you very much. Uh, well, Turkish defense industry has been on the, the uh, headlines for the past few years, uh, and it's been increased increasingly so because of the effects and the roles of the products that Turkish defense industry has manufactured and developed because uh, for the past uh, 10, to 10 to 15 years, the uh, amount of resources allocated to improving local defense industry base have uh, increased significantly. Uh, this is the reason of a strategic long-term decision taken by Turkey that can be traced back to uh, 1960s when Turkey faced the necessity of a local defense industry and defense autarky or, or self-sufficiency self in, in, in armaments uh, to pursue national interests. Uh, after uh, the US arms embargo in 1975 until 1978, uh, the, the efforts uh, to, to develop and establish a local defense industry have ha had increased. And uh, Turkey has only recently started to uh, take the positive or yes, positive results out of this long term, uh, long term uh, endeavor with many ups and downs. Uh, as seen in the uh, armed drones, like Bayraktar, like Anka, uh, the, 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 the develop, developed sophisticated uh, indigenous products uh, have been successful in, in, in countering terrorism 
as well as uh, finding uh, niche exports or uh, gaining export successes, which we will mention later. So this, uh, this new era or this new period uh, has brought a lot of new opportunities and also challenges to Turkish defense industry because Turkey uh, has re very recently begun to experience the political and economic aspects of defense exports or defense industry in general. So as a, as a short, mm -hmm. in, in short, uh, I can say that uh, Turkey is now exploring a new area uh, where uh, Turkey is now learning that uh, defense industry is not just uh, established to equip the armed forces of a nation, but also a political tool as well as an industrial and financial tools also. And I believe we will elaborate more on this later. But uh, for now, I can say this, uh, I can uh, summarize as this. Okay, I think this, uh, it's a really good news for Turkey. Now they, uh, the defense industry has realized that there are a lot of opportunities in different aspects as well, as far as only for the military equipment and all these things. So uh, 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 I'm now moving to Mr. Shafak. Mr. Shafak, what do you think, what are the capital raising trends in the industry at the moment? In general, in Turkish industry, there is only, uh, again, a government-backed uh, initiatives that some government-backed companies are investing into some different companies. And uh, also the we see in, in the recent years and also this year that there are some IPOs in the defense industry. Uh, but I think that, that the private equity should also be developed because there are two opportunities for the private equity. Uh, the first approach is uh, it's, it's all about the supply chain consolidation. And the second, uh, as Arda mentioned, defense is not only the defense, so there should be a, a technology focused innovation and which is a, uh, uh, which is which is like a, an, a tool for the private equities to invest more. Uh, and I believe that the private equities has historically been underinvested in, in aerospace and defense and in cooperation to other sectors because of the, the perceived incompatibility with the nature of the sectors, contracts and cash flow models, and this, some several barriers to, barriers to entry. Uh, this includes the fact that the aerospace and defense is perceived to be a, a relatively close shop dominated by a small cohort of the, the, the actors. And a feature of the sector is a long-term contracts that are set up between the suppliers and the OEMs. And uh, these contracts supply the equipment for research and development and the CapEx heavy programs that have 20 or uh, 30 year lives. And while these 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 offer the steady cash flow they do not necessarily guarantee the rapid profits and this has been a long time incompatible with the traditional model of the private equity investing uh, however i believe that the, the those paradigmas are now closer together than they have ever been and that, that the traditional private equity model can also be brought to the industry in a manner that it achieves a far greater mutual benefits than were possible before and further investing in a defense in, in, in particular has been inhibited certainly amongst the European public private equity houses by the more restrictive approach they have taken towards what's, what's deemed uh, to be acceptable from an investment perspective. So the offensive defense assets such as weaponry, for instance, likely fall outside what investment committees deem an acceptable investment with the significant uh, ESG issues that accompany them. Even some defensive assets such as anti-craft weaponry will be included on this list as well. Uh, the recent developments in the technology have greatly broadened that may be classified as a defense asset. And it now includes a non-kinetic and indeed a non-military areas such as a cyber defense or and surveillance, which will help to remove the such reputational barriers to the investment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Um... What uh, now? I've moved to Mr. Adam of Lutulu. 
Uh, sir, can you please uh, enlighten the prominent regions for Turkish defense exports and what are the advantages and disadvantages? Well, uh, obviously the most popular item on the list of Turkish defense exports uh, are drones, armed or unarmed uh, ISR drones. Uh, these uh, have been uh, on the agenda or on the headlines for the past two, three years, uh, starting in 19, uh, 2019, uh, Turkey started to export drones, starting with Qatar, and then Ukraine, and uh, like a like snowfall, many countries have uh, been on the line uh, ordering uh, the Bayraktar, uh, Bayraktar Akunji, Bayraktar TB2, and also TAI Anka Aksungur, as well as other smaller uh, drones from other manufacturers. So uh, drones or drone technologies uh, have become the main export item uh, for Turkish defense industry. But I want to underline that the, the, the list uh, also contains other sophisticated defense platforms, such as warships. Uh, Milya, the uh, Corvette uh, warship, uh, what has been exported to Pakistan, uh, Ukraine, and Turkey is a very strong contender in Malaysia's uh, project. Uh, as well as Turkey's uh, exports in other uh, classes of naval ships, as well as naval upgrade projects, uh, the Pakistan submarine upgrade being the most important one. Uh, and also we can uh, classify another item as air platforms. Uh, the Hürkuş uh, and attack, uh, attack helicopter by Turkish Aerospace Industries have been uh, exported to a number of countries and uh, Turkish Aerospace has been actively uh, promoting these, uh, these products. So these three uh, types of uh, defense products and their values, increasing values, show us a trend in Turkish defense exports. Uh, Turkey has started to export uh, sophisticated system of systems. For example, take the drone example. Uh, a drone consists of an air platform, a ground control station, uh, a data link or communications system, and also other support systems. So it is a whole, a package uh, consisting of sophisticated equipment. Likewise, a warship like the Milgan. It consists of uh, advanced electronics, sensors, weapon systems, uh, platform management systems, uh, a lot of different types of sophisticated machinery. So, uh, and also Turkey exports, Turkey has exported uh, different versions of Milgam based on customers' requirements, uh, modifying uh, the platform with different types of weapons, sensors, and systems. So all in all, this shows that uh, coming to the advantage versus disadvantage part, uh, Turkey has shown a remarkable uh, cap cap capability to uh, modify an existing platform or product uh, to tailor the customer's requirements. This is a very important advantage. Another one is that all, almost virtually all of Turkey's defense products have been uh, combat proven. Uh, the drones being the most significant examples. They have been very successfully uh, used in counterterrorism operations for the past five to six years. And also, Turkey is able to offer NATO standard uh, platforms, NATO standards, designs, and manufacturing qualities, uh, but uh, with virtually no political strings attached. This is a very important advantage for Turkey when entering into uh, challenging markets such as Africa, uh, Middle East, and South Asia, uh, where countries seek for advanced quality NATO standard or Western standard uh, products with no political uh, conditions or restrictions. Coming to the disadvantage uh, part, uh, Turkey is a newcomer to the markets. Mm -hmm. And many of the products and solutions that Turkey offer are relatively new designs. And uh, supporting these products throughout a long life uh, service, 
service life uh, can be challenging uh, and uh, might be demanding to, uh, to, to have the presence of uh, SMEs uh, specialized in providing parts, uh, subsystems, maintenance and support. And also, uh, Turkey needs to develop a good financial support system in uh, supporting its uh, defense exports, pretty much like the foreign military sales system of United States. Uh, Turkey needs to have a robust, a sound uh, financial support system to, uh, le uh, to uh, leverage its defense exports in new markets. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's it's uh, the Turkish weaponry is already very famous around the world, and it's been yeah. a while. And uh, can you also uh, please tell us more about the Harkash project? I think it is started in, back in two thousand six, and now it's progressing uh, in a very good way. Uh, exactly. The Turkey. There's a very unique uh, feature of Turkish defense industry where the end user, the industry, and the government or the procurement agency, uh, the, 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 the triangle uh, is in constant communication and all the systems and uh, products uh, that have been delivered to the end user are in constant uh, modification or updates. So uh, this is, uh, this is uh, observed in many Turkey, Turkish defense industry products and uh, it's a very unique feature. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Sipak. Can you please uh, uh, coming to the to to the challenges that Turkey is going to face in the defense market as a newcomer? Can you please tell us about how uh, the sanctions affect the industry? That's the most harsh, the, the harshest, I think, the question. And uh, I choose the real the reasons by starting with the consequences rather than than the opposite. Uh, so let's us start with the final and up to date situation of of the economy in Turkey. Uh, Turkey, whom said to have a repeat, have a, a, a repeat economic growth, has started to encounter uh, remarkable obstacles in the past years, which concluded in the, the deceleration of the mentioned growth. So the question we need to raise is how Turkey got itself in this position. Uh, at this point, uh, the political aspects of the recent developments will become uh, inseparable part of, of the portrait. Uh, uh, the old time frame will be determined starting from the date of the failed coup attempt, which was in, in July 2016. On this very day, an uh, organized coup group within the Turkish armed forces attempted to coup against the institutions and the government. And the, the coup was prevented, but the effects remained up to the present and still continues to remain. Uh, from the political perspective. First of all, following the failed coup, Turkey got into the state of emergency period, which lasted for two years and three days uh, until 2018. And during this period, the attraction was mostly on the dismissals of the public officers, custodies and arrests uh, raised against the people who were being charged with involving in the, in the body organization which plotted the cup. Uh, a similar case was witnessed by the by most of us, which was as all as many of you know that Andrew Brunson, the American pastor, was uh, among the group of people accused who got arrested on the account of the acquisition of being a member of the Gulen community and committing a crime on behalf of PKK in Gulen community. And uh, President Erdogan then requested a swap uh, involving the delivery of the Gulen to Turkey in return to Brunson's delivery to US. And uh, the reaction received from the Trump administration was extremely sharp, strong and aggressive reaction. And the particular issue remained as the most important issue uh, regarding the relation of the countries until Brunson's release in 2018. Um, this incident was actually the initiator element that triggered the relations to downgrade, and it was just the tip of the icebreak. Uh, however, it's not possible to load the weight of the Turkey's present-day economy to this single location. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the situation we have is a collaborative consequence resulted by various collective and cumulative parameters. So. Uh, 
when, when we concentrate on the parameters after the start of the regression in terms of the Turkey's relation with the US, the approach of the US towards Syria and the Kurdish uh, YPG uh, located in Syria has caused even more confusion. And then it has followed by S-400s. And then there have been many issues involved. And uh, as a result of all these issues, Turkey is now a long-standing member of NATO and also uh, allied to the United States. However, Turkey is also deemed as ad uh, America's adversary under the cuts of sanctions. Uh, it's not new that both countries have tensions on, on certain matters, including but not limited to Russia, Syria, East Mediterranean, Iran, Azerbaijan, and the US, the first added Turkish government officers on the STN list in October 2019, which is followed by several draft bills against Turkey. And as far as I know, there are still some bills at the Congress which are weak or heavy. I don't know about the, the impl implications of that, but imposing they are all imposing sanctions to Turkey directly targeting the oil and gas related products and services and also the military. Uh, the reaction from Turkish government agencies against CASA sanctions was massive. And the Erdogan, President Erdogan stated that the, the CASA sanctions have never been imposed on, on any country since they were first approved in 2017. And the Turkey is the first country that has faced CASA and it's the US NATO ally. He further added that I remember that the, the US sanctions aim to prevent Turkey's development in the defense industry and make the country dependent once again. Uh, as of today, Mr. Demir, the head of the SSP, the agency of the uh, defense acquisitions, stated that the, the Turkey will focus on localization efforts in response to sanctions, whilst the reactions by the government agencies being continued to companies doing uh, and not doing aerospace defense business, try to understand what the legal results are and how can they be, how can they fall under this cuts of sanctions. And, uh, and the companies selling the US and the UK products uh, have started to uh, slow down. Uh, the, the companies from the US and the UK side slow down the, the business in Turkey. And uh, in, in the business community, the many people think that the cuts of sanctions only targets the aerospace and defense industries, but there is a bill of that. And we are now out of the F-35 program, which is cost, which, which costs more than $12 billion uh, because the Turkey bought uh, S-400 missiles from the Russia. And uh, I don't know the, how the, the sanctions will affect, but it's obvious that the, the existing sanctions and the implications of those are still you know, heavily affecting the industry. I think one, one of the one of the participants, one of the attendees, uh, raised a uh, hand and he wants to ask some questions. So if anyone asks questions, he can just write us uh, in the questions uh, bar and we, we will uh, ask him. All right. Um, now, coming back to Mr. Adam Abdul Olu. Uh, uh, sir, what is the role of joint ventures, especially the challenges? Uh, do you think the challenges can be overcome or, uh, with the joint ventures of, with the private sector and uh, maybe some international players or something? Uh, uh, in fact, difficult question because uh, I've been facing this, I've been coming across this question for the past many years. Uh, I've been working with a lot, uh, with a number of uh, American and uh, UK uh, defense contractors, uh, large ones mostly, and uh, especially the first comers to Turkish defense market always come up with uh, the idea of forming a joint venture with a local sub, uh, local entity. Uh, when looking back uh, mm -hmm. at the history of Turkish defense industry, we see that with a, num with a number of exceptions, uh, forming uh, forming joint ventures uh, have not uh, been uh, successful in uh, increasing presence in Turkish defense industry. There are a few number of exceptions, as I mentioned, like uh, several uh, companies, uh, which I won't name, uh, but for uh, many joint ventures uh, have either failed outright or uh, have not managed to uh, sustain their business operations for a long time. 
or manage to secure contracts. I think one of the prime reasons for this is the lack of uh, lack of appreciation or comprehension by foreign entities with regards to uh, with regards to uh, Turkey's ambitions, motivations uh, in developing defense industry as well as local dynamics. By dynamics, I mean uh, the relationship between the industry, the procurement or government, procurement agencies or government, and the end users. Uh, I have uh, come across many foreign companies willing to establish joint ventures uh, coming to Turkey with the idea of forming a joint venture, but uh, without any without any uh, credible business plan or idea on how to share the know-how or technology or the work share or risks. Uh, that might be one of the uh, most important reasons uh, behind this uh, outcome. Another one uh, would be uh, a difference in expectations by both sides. Uh, this second factor is inherently related to the first factor, uh, which is the lack of comprehension by foreign entities. A uh, lack of communications or uh, a weakness in communications or disregard by both sides in the business uh, practices, uh, legislations, uh, legislative frameworks by both sides might be another factor in, 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 uh, in contributing to the challenges against joint ventures. Uh, this being said, I still believe in joint ventures because they uh, might create a uh, spillover effect, which is very crucial for both sides to increase their uh, experience, knowledge base, and capabilities. But uh, forming up a long-term successful joint venture requires many trade-offs by both sides. And this is not easy to achieve. Uh, but at the end of the day, especially given the uh, given uh, current uh, technological barriers and risks involved, such as costs, such as geopolitical uh, uncertainties, uh, I think joint ventures might still be a good idea to explore new markets and new technological capabilities. And Turkey is indeed a promising. Uh, promising uh, country to form new joint ventures uh, because it indeed is a gateway to many different markets such as Africa, Middle East, and South Asia. Great. Uh, thank you so much. So recently, one of the participants asked a question and the question is open to both of you, Mr. Shafak and Mr. Adha. Uh, does Turkey have the advanced manufacturing capabilities in their national supply chain to produce high-tech systems? Or would you need to collaborate with inter other international companies to expand the technical needs of Turkey's defense requirements? Uh, may I? Yes. Uh, uh, I believe that Turkey uh, has very few uh, risks involved or very few deficiencies with regards to manufacturing capabilities. Uh, this is especially so uh, in. in uh, structural uh, or computer-aided engineering uh, parts. Uh, I think uh, Turkey uh, has some way to go in, in increasing its uh, capabilities in uh, production, electronics production or microwave, uh, microelectronics. Uh, but uh, I think Turkey uh, is very well able to uh, offer very unique, very advanced manufacturing capabilities, computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturing. And uh, there are many more opportunities in uh, different areas, as I mentioned. From my perspective, yeah, yeah. But from my perspective, I observe that this is an issue about the priorities on industrial cooperation programs. And uh, when we consider where the, the timeline that the Turkey has stepped over on the industrial participation programs, now we do focus on the technology transfer and the export. So 
Uh, I'm not a market guy. I'm just a legal expert in industry participation programs. But I think that even there are some ways that that is the priority of the of the the government to collaborate with the companies, especially under some certain offset programs for uh, developing the export and the the technology capabilities. Which means that in an, in another sense, it means that yeah, it it needs collaboration because the market that the Turkey is selling is mostly the market limited to the to the east of the country, not the west of the country. So there should be a collaboration on that, on the, especially under the offset programs. Uh, and Mr. Shepard, can you please uh, elaborate further at a higher level? What are the considerable offset policies across the country? And what are the changing priorities? Of course, it is the technology transfer. It takes the priority. And it's understood that the Turkey has uh, respected world-class companies and the technologies that can profitably be developed and expanded. Uh, however, Turkey's reality is that the many US and the European and the Asian group companies uh, are still, and I think will be cautious about making new investment in Turkey uh, because of the current political and the economic environment. Uh, so if a company such wants, uh, that wants to grow its global activities, it may want to pursue and focus on creating the strategic industry partnerships uh, that will leverage its intellectual property and know-how and uh, create commercially viable joint ventures in those regions or the countries where there is a natural synergy and the market demand for the products that a company can produce. Uh, many countries are continuing to focus on producing and sourcing uh, their products from local suppliers. For example, the Buy American Act is there. And the, the legislation in the United States is requiring the U.S. government agencies also to, to source their products from the U.S. companies, as recently been uh, underlined and repeated uh, in the remarks of the Biden to the nation. Uh, at, at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, some countries can provide very attractive economic incentives for foreign companies that can deliver state-of-art technologies and the human capabilities to develop uh, uh, and uh, to, to, to add more on the local operations. And the same policies also headed uh, in Turkey, although Turkey is, uh, has an infamous offset program in the aerospace and defense sectors. Uh, at this time, uh, I would not suggest or any company to invest uh, for the or, or pursuing the existing Turkish offset programs as a vehicle to develop their local operations for the new programs or for the new contracts, it, it might be promising, especially related to the F, possible F-16 sales. But for the existing programs, I do not uh, suggest the companies to do so because offset more often than not complicates and delays on the commercial opportunities and in recent years most initiatives do not come to the successful fruition so uh, if that that's all I say about the offset programs in Turkey and uh, uh, we have received one more question from one of the attendees uh, Mr. Shafak it's related to your uh, recent answer. So can you please uh, uh, answer it? Um, the question says that, as you know, Biden administration's push for a new sale of F-16 Viper fighter jets to the Turkish Air Force is facing resistance from the Congress and substantial number of TF access uh, entering service will take time. Anka 3 and Kizlima projects are still fluid plan for modernizing the aviation fleets. Under these circumstances, how do you envisage uh, future tactical capabilities of Air Force in the next decade? I think I'm not the right guy to answer this question. I think uh, Arda would like to uh, answer it better than me because he knows the capabilities better than me. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, yes, indeed, Turkish Air Force uh, is facing a significant, uh, a remarkable risk of losing the qualitative uh, edge uh, regard, uh, compared to, to its neighbors, uh, not just because of the removal from the F-35 program, 
but also it's a, a dramatic shift, a, a mandatory shift in the modernization plans against the schedule and also uh, the increased pace of modernization of neighboring countries uh, to their uh, air forces. Greece acquiring uh, upgraded Viper jets and Rafales from France. Uh, Israel uh, acquiring F-35s, uh, F-15, new generation uh, F-15s and upgrading existing ones. Egypt likewise acquiring Rafales. Uh, Turkey uh, having one of the largest F-16 fleets, but uh, becoming slightly uh, uh, outdated. Uh, might be losing its uh, air superiority in the region. Uh, this is not just a military risk, but also, but also ha it has an inherent uh, political risk also, because uh, based on the, the air and also naval superiority, uh, Turkey has been able to pursue its uh, national interests in the Asian and Eastern Mediterranean seas, but it might be increasingly difficult to do so uh, in the coming decade or so, uh, if any uh, any solid steps are not taken, that that's why uh, the F-16 uh, request from the United States is important to fulfill the capability gap until the uh, national fighter jets and also uh, armed drones uh, like Kızılderma and Anka 3 arrive. Uh, but in the likelihood of a denial by United States government uh, for the F-16 case, uh, the most uh, the most uh, speculated uh, alternative would be the Typhoon, Eurofighter Typhoon from United Kingdom. Uh, that also comes with some, some risks involved because Eurofighter Typhoon is the product of a four country uh, consortium, uh, United Kingdom being the only one, being one of them. Uh, others, others are Italy, Spain, and Germany. So Turkey will need to uh, be in dialogue with four countries simultaneously uh, to acquire the jets and also to secure its uh, maintenance. If uh, the Typhoon deal does not go ahead, uh, then uh, the most, I think, the most feasible uh, option would be uh, to look at local alternatives such as local upgrades uh, to the F-16 fleet, and also uh, maybe increasing the resources allocated to the uh, HURJET, the National, National Fighter Jet MMU, Anka 3 and Kızılderma projects to achieve uh, their operational uh, status as soon as possible. Uh, I don't think any alternatives such as uh, acquiring jets from China or Russia uh, would be politically, technically and economically feasible or possible. Uh, so, as a summary, I can say that if the F-16 deal with the United States uh, does not go uh, ahead, uh, Typhoon would be another uh, candidate, and uh, developing local alternatives would be another. Uh, but one way or another, Turkey had to uh, create alternatives, uh, not just to get the military uh, qualitative superiority, but also to gain the strategic uh, upper hand in the region. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. So, um, coming back to Mr. Shafak, Mr. Shafak, what are the opportunities for diversified involvement to Turkish uh, aerospace and defense industry? Uh, what do you think? That's for certain that there are some promising areas, the space technologies, technological innovations, assets that are rich in intellectual property, training and maintenance sectors in the defense industry, and the heavily armored uh, smaller uh, fighting vehicles. I think there are the are other promising areas. And from the funding perspective, I think there should be a, a new mechanism which should not be underinvested and underestimated to uh, for for the seed funding of some R and D uh, initiatives because the country has a very vast and, and experienced teams on the R and D issues, uh, which are looking for some opportunities from abroad, uh, which is all which may result with some. The, which may result with with some technology transfer 
uh, in contrary to what the government requires. So, uh, as I said, for the future, uh, if there will be a sales from the United States, I, I believe that the offset opportunities will be also on the edge, and, and we will be discussing all about these issues to develop the, the, the economy. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mevutlu, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, sort of different questions uh, from the topic. That what are uh, going to be the likely effects for, for the recent earthquake and the presidential elections uh, on the defense industry? Well, uh, the, the tragic event uh, in February, early February this year, uh, claimed uh, substantial number of uh, lives and it is indeed a catastrophic event uh, that has many implications and uh, one of the effects on Turkish defense industry would be uh, uh, like cutting back or scaling back of some financial resources because uh, the latest official figures the economic impact of the earthquake uh, uh, guess it's uh, more than hundreds of billion dollars. So that's a very huge damage to the Turkish economy, uh, to all industries and sectors. And I think uh, one of the uh, first or more profound effects would be uh, scaling back some resources allocated to local maybe development projects that have not matured or that have not uh, past a certain threshold, uh, some major projects such as the National Combat Jet or uh, some drone projects might not be affected at all because they have passed certain uh, milestones or some they have achieved some maturity uh, with regards to project management. But uh, the projects that are in earlier phases of development uh, or design might be affected. That is a, that's a considerable risk. Risk uh, coming to the elections. Uh, that also uh, is a speculative. But if uh, if the government stays the same, uh, the ruling party plus uh, the president uh, Erdogan uh, continues uh, in office, uh, we would not expect to see major changes to the structure of the defense industry or projects. Maybe some uh, reorganizations or reforms could be expected, but no major changes. Uh, in the event of a change of uh, ruling party plus or, and or uh, president, uh, I personally don't expect to see uh, dramatic changes uh, with regards to the direction or the structure of the defense industry because uh, for the past 20 years, yes, Turkish defense industry has achieved a remarkable success. And um, most of the credits go to uh, the President Recep Tayyip Erdogan himself because he personally uh, followed many programs. I personally witnessed this on many different occasions. Uh, and he personally, or the ruling party, uh, is responsible of uh, of this achievement. But uh, we should also remember that achieving self-sufficiency in the defense industry has always been a strategic goal for Turkey, uh, as I mentioned earlier in our conversation, uh, starting from 1960s. And it is a part of Turkey's strategic alignment or orientation uh, in this part of the world. Uh, so achieving self-sufficiency in armament production or defense production has always been uh, one of the highest priorities of the Republic of Turkey. So uh, that being uh, said, I don't expect a major dramatic shift in the orientation or the structuring of the defense industry. But of course, uh, that depends on the outcome of the elections. And I think uh, we will see in, in a very short time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shafak, uh, coming back to the sanctions part uh, that we recently discussed, uh, I wanted to know that 
as the sanctions are sharpened on Russia by the Western countries. Uh, so how do you think Turkey position itself in uh, its aerospace and defense industry, both the relations uh, with, the, with the Russia and Ukraine? Um, first, although a member of NATO and an applicant for the EU accession, uh, uh, Turkey is refusing to participate in order to protect its interests, and this also involves the road transport operations. Uh, many experts pointed out that the Turkey doubled its export to Russia in 2022, and uh, Turkey has gone from virtually no exports of semiconductors to Russia in 2021 to now being the fourth largest supplier. Uh, we know that the Biden administration is working on, on making sanctions targeting Russia in a more effective way by explicitly warning Russian trading partners that they run legal risk doing business with the banned entities. And the U.S. officers uh, recently met with the government officials and the banking sector representatives in Turkey to discuss how uh, the U.S. sanctions on Russia affect the Turkish businesses as a part of the regional tour uh, that also included the United Arab Emirates. So these two countries, the Turkey and the United Arab Emirates, are already under the radar of the United States government. And uh, it looks that the US is focusing on depriving the Russia's military uh, of advanced equipment by threatening uh, to enact uh, secondary sanctions on businesses that still trade with Russia, which will have, of course, an absolute effect in, between the, in, in the relations between Russia and Turkey by means of defense. But as far as I know, we do not sell any defense products to Russia. Uh, further, we, we support Ukraine by selling the drones to them. So there should be a balance, you know, the policy in that. And the, But we know that the U.S. officers urged the companies to take also extra precautions, especially when it comes to dual use technologies and the technology transfers that could be used by, by, by the Russian military industrial complex. Um, a couple of days ago, the Turkish customs officials have suddenly stopped uh, permitting the transfer of the sanctioned goods uh, bound for Russia through Turkish territory. And we will see the upcoming developments, but I strictly suggest aerospace and defense companies enhancing due diligence beyond uh, checking the U.S. sanctions list, because uh, even it's not a part of the, the conventional arms, uh, there should be some dual use related risks on that issues. And uh, and for the sales in, in Ukraine, it looks like it's a government policy that the Ukraine and the Turkey is a great mutual benefits and the collaboration on the defense industry. So it looks that it will continue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and coming back to Mr. Ardam of the Tulu. Uh, sir, can you please tell us uh, the defense uh, industry, how, how does its relationship is with other sectors? such as automotive, uh, automotive, medical, communication, and transportation. What are they doing with other sectors? Uh, how, how are they developing and things like that? Uh, in Turkey, the uh, relationship between defense industry and other neighboring sectors have, develop, have begun developing only recently for the past maybe five to 10 years. This relationship has been uh, has manifested itself strong in uh, uh, like uh, communications, uh, transportation and medical sectors, especially. Uh, for example, during the COVID-19 uh, period, uh, Turkish defense companies have uh, showed uh, capability to react very rapidly to the increased requirements uh, from the medical sector and from the general population with regards to masks, breathing devices, and other, uh, other, other equipment that require sophisticated uh, or high capability manufacturing uh, production. Uh, so uh, another example could be in the ICT sector. Uh, many Turkish defense industries have either uh, product lines or have spin-offs that are active in ICT sector, offering their products and services to commercial 
markets or uh, or end users. Uh, another good example is uh, Turkey's uh, electric vehicle initiative, the TOG. Uh, the TOG project, the electric uh, automobile, has many uh, engineers and designers uh, with experience, experienced designers and engineers from defense industry uh, that have uh, participated to the projects uh, from industrial design uh, to the battery uh, parts uh, to the other uh, complicated uh, aspects of the program. Uh, but as I said, this, is, this has been a very recent trend and it needs to be expanded, and this needs to be a, uh, to a bilateral relationship between two sides, the defense side and other commercial sectors, because uh, contrary to popular belief, Turkey's defense industry, or many defense industries, especially in the developing nations, uh, do not generate much uh, economic impact on the national's economy. Turkey being uh, uh, like, a $700 billion economy uh, has its defense industry uh, generating a total revenue of more than $10 billion. Uh, and the total export figures of Turkish defense industry is more than $4 billion, uh, maybe close to $5 billion, I'm not sure. So uh, this compared to the size of Turkish economy, the defense industry takes a very small portion uh, from the overall uh, impact. So in order to increase this economic impact, uh, the defense industry, uh, Turkey's defense industry, needs to improve its ties with other sectors, uh, but that requires time and significant investment into human resources and infrastructure. Uh, that's a time-consuming uh, process. I think we have one more question. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have a question from the audience. We have one more question, right? And the question is open for both of you. Uh, is it possible to go back to the F-35 program by finding a solution to the S-400 and F-35 problem? I don't know if this question is theoretically or practically. <laughs> well, are they, are well they... uh, there are two sub questions to this uh, one is turkey rejoining the program as a program partner and the other one is mm -hmm. Turkey force getting f-35s uh, i think turkey rejoining uh, to the program as a partner is impossible uh, or let's say i'm an engineer let's say it's uh, 99 percent impossible let's say uh, because of the structure of the program and uh, distribution of the work shares. Uh, Turkey regaining access to some work shares from the program uh, would create a lot of implications and it, it's, it's, it's so difficult that it's impossible. Uh, Turkish Air Force getting F-35s, it is theoretically possible, uh, but it's a very, very long shot. Uh, these two sub questions also require the presence of a resolution to the S400 case, of course. And if, even if the S400 issue is resolved one way or another, uh, Turkey getting the F35 uh, would depend on a number of other uh, resolutions uh, with regards to Turkish US bilateral relations, S400 being only one of the obstacles. So in summary, I don't think that uh, Turkish Air Force getting F-35s would be possible in the foreseeable future, uh, but not outright impossible as uh, Turkey rejoining uh, the program uh, as a partner nation again. Thank you, thank you so much. We have one more question. Uh, how can we assess financial excess exports about 4.5 billion dollars revenue about 11 billion dollars but does any participants have any information as to resources allocated uh, Mr. Shafak, or? Uh, it's it's open for both of you well uh, traditionally uh, around 50 to 60 percent of turkey's exports uh, have come from offsets 
but uh, that uh, percentage uh, was uh, has been declining for the past few years. It may not be uh, at around that figure uh, for 2022, uh, but again, a significant part of the exports come from offsets. Uh, that can uh, that I can say uh, for the total uh, revenue. Uh, I think we should wait for the uh, report by SASAT, Turkey's Defense Industry Manufacturers Association, because uh, that those yearly reports provide many insights and details on the breakdown of uh, imports, exports, and total revenues of Turkish defense industry. Uh, but traditionally, uh, land systems and land vehicles get get a huge portion of the export. I think uh, the percentage of uh, air platforms and ammunitions have increased in the past uh, several years. Uh, but then again, I think uh, we will be uh, we will have access to more details when the latest uh, performance report by Sasat uh, is published. Uh, I think in a couple of maybe weeks or months. Just to add to you that I think that uh, along with the capabilities and reaching out to the products and the development in the products, that is also a big issue for Turkey to reaching out to the markets. And the reaching out to the markets, especially for the Western part and on the natural allies, it all depends on the, the political situation and the, and the relations between the companies. And the... Uh, from very theoretically perspective, if you are subject to cuts and sanctions, it's obvious that the no NATO country will buy anything from you. Uh, and then you will have an, another concentration to the Eastern countries or the African countries or the countries in the Gulf uh, with a limited market size. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ada and Mr. Shafak. Uh, I think uh, um, uh, it's been a while and we, we really think both of you uh, to join us today and uh, spare some time from your busy schedule. And uh, I'm very thankful to the audience who joined us today and uh, asked some really good questions as well. And uh, the knowledge was really insightful for all of us. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.